It's getting harder and harder to defend at a high level than the NBA. In today's age of pace, space, three-point shooting, and seven-footers taking three-point jump shots, it can be very difficult to be a very good defensive team. But NBA teams have adjusted on the defensive end with creative techniques, concepts, and different closeouts than we have seen in the past. In this video breakdown, we'll dive into some of those actions, techniques, and how the NBA teams defend at the highest level. NBA teams are spreading the floor out more and more, as we can see from these pictures shown from the previous NBA Finals. In the 90s, basically everybody was inside the paint at a certain time, whether playing out of the post or shooting heavy mid-range jumpers. In the mid-2000s, you'd see teams spread out a little bit more, but you're still playing a conventional two-big lineup with most players inside the three-point line. As we got into the 2010s, the Miami Heat team started to spread out a little bit more, but still kept players in the dunker spot so a big could roam in the paint. When we hit the 2015 season, the Warriors started to go super small with Draymond Green at the five, spread teams out, five out, and that helped them capture their NBA titles and led them on that run. The Toronto Raptors even had the same five out spacing with Marc Gasol and Ibaka splitting time on the floor. And then of course, in this latest NBA Finals, we saw the Denver Nuggets playing a complete five out system on offense with Nikola Jokic, and then also their small ball secondary lineup playing Gordon at the five at the bench. With defenses not being able to get as physical as they used to, it can seem impossible to defend in today's modern NBA. But what is not impossible is becoming a better version of yourself with today's video sponsor, AG1. AG1 is a nutritional drink that should easily become a habit in the mornings to start your day off right. Some of the benefits that I really enjoy are more focus and clarity, as well as more sustained energy throughout the day. In just one simple scoop, AG1 combines nine health products that work together as one, as well as the highest quality ingredients that taste great and make you feel better. As someone who recently became a head coach, as a husband, a father, and a full-time business owner, it can be difficult for me to find ways to be healthier, but AG1 provides just that. My favorite part about AG1 are the travel packs. This makes it very easy to stay committed to my health goals wherever I am and gives me a great boost of energy before heading off to practice so I can ensure our team gets the best version of myself. After using AG1 for the past few weeks personally, I can confidently say that I will continue using them in the future. Thank you so much to AG1 for sponsoring this video. Go to drinkag1.com backslash hoops to get a free one year supply of vitamin D3 plus K2 and five AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Thanks to AG1 for sponsoring today's video. When breaking down modern NBA defense in the Substack articles I've been working on, the biggest thing that stood out to me was you have to include analytics, at least some part of this, with the overall philosophy when teams play. No clearer example of this is looking at the top 10 defenses and the three-point attempt rate that they give up, which means the percentage of shots they give up from three-point range. For example, the Cavs tended to run three-point shooters off the line more and funnel them into their rim protectors, Evan Mobley and Jared Allen, where a team like the Miami Heat tend to overhelp and give up a lot more threes because they will switch most things with Bam, taking their rim protection away, so they tend to overhelp more rather than rely on their consistent rim protection. I think the easiest way to look at defense is in three moments. The point of attack defense, or the pickup points, the coverages like ball screen, pin downs, things like that, and the off ball rotations after those coverages in space. Defense obviously starts in transition and that's where we're gonna talk about the pickup point or the point where the player basically stops the ball. Most pickup points are going to be a little bit lower, uh, but you'll see some teams uh, like the Heat will tend to try to pick up a little bit higher. And this, these pickup points get higher and higher as the playoffs go along to where they can put more pressure on the ball, drain the shot clock down, and force the offense into tougher shots. Uh, but the pickup point in general is going to be just inside the logo and above the three-point line to essentially slow down the ball handler before they get to the three-point line and kind of contain that before they get too deep. And then teams like the Miami Heat and especially last year the Portland Trailblazers would run their 2-2-1 press, which two players up top, two player in the middle, and one player back, falling back into a 2-3 zone. The goal of this is to essentially slow down the offense, again, waste time off that shot clock, force them to play against an unconventional zone defense that NBA teams tend to play a little bit slower to attack out of. 
The first example we can see the pickup point is a little bit higher, forcing the ball handler off one side going to his left hand. We have the rotations behind them where Jokic is now in the help the helper position and then recover out to a three point shot. Even though NBA teams are hunting more three point shots, transition defense still puts an emphasis on stopping the ball, helping in the paint first. A good example of that here is Al Horford stunting in on that rim run and then staying home on the corner. And we'll see this again where Horford kind of shows like he might help on the rim run and then stays as Derek White cuts off the ball. Teams will clearly force contain or contain the ball more than they will look to maybe even recover out to three point shooters. Stopping the ball first obviously is the main thing that beats you. Here the Heat do a good job containing the ball on the strong side or the ball side with Butler and Robinson that allows the weak side players to get in good defensive position. They get matched up one on one, contain the drive and get a good contest. Transition defense is chaotic, so a good communication is imperative. We can see two great clips here from the Nuggets where Contavious Caldwell Pope is already early pointing and communicating with players behind him, telling Jokic to take the ball, Aaron Gordon's communicating who's on the weak side, and just basically pointing and talking who is guarding who. Another good example of that here is Gordon and Brown communicating who's guarding who, Gordon matching up with Butler in transition, Brown in the corner. Once the ball is contained and communication is clear, the first thing you'll see teams do is load to the ball, even at the risk of giving up open threes. Here an example from the Celtics where Smart and Tatum are both essentially on BAM, but still doing a good job containing the ball where Tatum is gonna stop the ball first rather than closing out to the corner three, stopping that drive to the rim first. Here, Contavious Caldwell Pope does a good job loading to Bam early in offense, keeping him contained on one side, then recovering out to his man. All four Nuggets are now matched up, and they've stopped the early advantage for the Heat. And frankly, transition just comes down to effort. Watch Jimmy Butler here give effort sprinting back, gets the swipe and deflection out of bounds, stopping the early break. Another example here from the Heat where Struess is really far behind the ball, but the effort to sprint back in transition allows him to get the block from behind and recover. Since we're talking about the NBA, we're going to have to give up something. The Heat do a good job getting behind the ball and give up an above the break three in transition. Another example here, playing four on five for the Nuggets. You're going to have to give up something so they eliminate semi-advantages and then contest a Butler floater. Moving on to coverages, we'll look at the least to most aggressive, starting with drop coverage. Uh, looking at ice, which is a version of drop, forcing it away from the ball. Up to touch, which is closer to the ball screener. And then a hedge, which is usually reserved for a like guard big screen. And then a blitz or hard aggressive trap on the pick and roll. We also will look at switching, but not in this video. I will save that for a dedicated video to how NBA teams switch on defense. Drop ball screen coverage is the most common where you see a big playing two or three feet off and dropping back into the lane. This is the most conventional ball screen defense during the regular season. You'll see bigs drop back in the lane, really sagging off, allowing that mid-range or contested mid-range, or if a player is not gonna rise from three-point land and fire too easily. A version of drop, but primarily on side or empty ball screens is ice, where the ball handler forces the ball away from the ball screen, and then the big essentially puts himself between the ball and the basket, trying to contain any drives and keep the ball on one side of the floor. The Nuggets do a good job of this on empty ball screens. Another example of this here is Aaron Gordon does a good job of jumping on the hip of Butler and taking the screen away, forcing him to the baseline, keeping him corralled on that one side with Jokic contesting. Up to touch is just that where the player defending the ball screen is almost touching the ball screener uh, and then retreating backwards, similar to drop coverage, just starting up a little bit higher. Hedging is more reserved for a guard big screen, so you see them trying to hunt Kennard here. He does a good job hedging. The goal is to force the ball handler away from the basket and then recover out to the three-point line or the next threat. This can also be used for three-point shooters as Jokic jumps out here on Robinson or for like a guard setting a ball screen for a big to hedge, force him away, and then recover out. Although not as common, you will see some teams blitz or trap if a player's you know got it going or they just want to give up a different look. You see Bam here blitzing out on Jamal Murray. The only negatives to blitzing is essentially you're taking two players and putting them on the ball, being more aggressive. So the players behind have to rotate. 
So here, as the blitz happens on Murray, you see Jokic is hit on the short roll. Now they're playing four on three on the backside, which means Jokic can now make the easy read and find Michael Porter Jr. Ends up missing, but still had that easy advantage. Whenever a ball screen's run, someone is responsible to tag the roll man or basically sink in and help on the player rolling to the rim. This is usually reserved for the low man opposite. So here, Dylan Brooks is responsible to tag the roll man and then do his best to close out after the pass is made. If the offense has a non-shooter on the floor, so here Jaron Jackson Jr. is guarding Jared Vanderbilt, they will have him usually roam or be the tag man off of a non-shooting threat, sometimes off of a strong side corner, which is usually a no-no in today's NBA. Here's a good example from the Warriors in the preseason with Kaminga being the low man responsible for tagging the roller. And then when the pass is made to the corner, there is an X out on the weak side with Moody rotating to the corner and then Kaminga flying out at the three point shooter. These low responsibilities are not in just ball screen scenarios, but anytime the ball is driven, typically the low man will be the one responsible for always helping, and then you'll have the help the helper situation. So here against the Nuggets, Bam is the player in the middle responsible for the help. So when the ball is driven by Jamal Murray, he's responsible for help as Lowry stunts and recovers in the gap, not fully helping to help slow down the drive. Bam is able to get up and get vertical, which means Martin now has to drop down on Gordon to help without any offensive rebounding opportunity. The IQ of the low man is very important. Here, Jokic helps out low, but doesn't overcommit. That allows him to make Butler make a tough pass and then get back to contest the Bam floater. Another example here where he has to rotate low off of Zeller in the corner, which who's not shooting threat, so he's not too concerned about it, but then recognizes he has to get out on the three-point shooter Robinson, switches out in an emergency situation, and on the drive, Gordon recognizes he's now the low help, and now he has a responsibility to stop the ball before it gets to the rim. Here's an example from the Phoenix Suns in the preseason where you can see two players both over help with KD being the low man. Now on this rotation out here, Beal normally would take the corner, but the fumble and the non-shooting threat of Isaiah Stewart compared to Burks means he rotates out to the wing. KD does a short closeout and then miss the three. Help is not exclusive to the low man. Sometimes you will see NBA players in the gap or almost like the nail defender where you see Kennard here at the nail closing a driving lane and then having to get out and recover to a three-point shooter. A lot of teams will prefer to do this if they switch a lot or don't have a ton of rim protection, like the Grizzlies will switch often. They keep a player at the nail and then close out to three-point shooters, especially in these above the break situations. But these gap helps essentially stop any driving scenario, uh, try to get deflection, try to make it a little bit harder for the offense to find easier driving lanes and be able to stop the ball. Perhaps the biggest defensive change is guarding in space, especially when teams play five out. For example, the Celtics here. On this drive, we have a low help from Gabe Vincent. And now the helper is Bam Adebayo in space, the center guarding two players in the corner and on the wing. He essentially has to drop down and defend two of them and guess where the pass is going to go. Most teams tend to drop the player and help to the corner. So on the drive here, you'll see the player on the opposite in space going to the corner first to take away the corner three. Now the next closeout is a closeout to taking away the extra or one more pass. And then the gap help in the middle stops the ball and only allows a contested pull up. If there is a player in the dunker spot, like Aaron Gordon here, you see Struess is going to dig down on the top shoulder and then close out to the three-point shooter. When closing out, modern NBA defense now dictates you close out to the gap or the extra pass like we saw previously. So you can see on some of these closeouts, it's not a close out to a shooter, it's a close out to the next pass. This allows them to slow down the ball rotations, stagnate the offense, and get an easier one-on-one -on -one contest. Modern day closeouts in the NBA are no longer the chop your feet four or five times and get on balance in a closeout. Most of them nowadays are flyby closeouts or launching yourself to the three-point shooter, trying to get a three-point contest or at least disrupting them. Here we see the gap help. Then once the ball is passed, you see a flyby closeout launching but not too out of control so you take yourself out of the play these closeouts are designed to make shooters put the ball on the floor or at least make the offense make another extra pass so the defense can scramble 
Another part of these flyby closeouts is closing out to the side of the shooter's body so you won't get the landing zone, either flagrant foul or and one foul called. Here's a good example of Bradley Beal noticing looking down at his feet and the offensive player's feet so he will not get called for that foul. And Duncan Robinson does a good job here of closing out to the side, contesting that ball. So the whole goal here is to essentially not have any contact with the shooter. So Butler here would normally go across Jamal Murray's body, but instead he goes to the side so he avoids any of those contact calls. And then, of course, we put it all together where you basically combine all of these concepts or ideas that the defense has into one defensive possession. And this is how modern NBA defense works now, where we have the first action here switch with Murray and KCP. Then we have up the touch coverage from Jokic on the ball screen. We have MPJ playing in space on the weak side on a shooter. Then on the drive after the closeout, we have a little gap help stunt by Murray. Gordon becomes the low help at the rim. And then in this scramble scenario, Jamal Murray has to see who is spaced, contest the closeout or react. He ends up getting a flyby closeout here. KCP rotates over and closes out to the extra. That leads to a tough drive with Jokic being the low help and contesting the floater, a perfect defensive possession in 2023. Thank you so much for watching this video. I will be doing a six part series on modern NBA defense on my sub stack. If you want to check that out there, the link is in the description below, as well as the next video on switching concepts in the modern NBA.